Don graduated from the special education PhD program at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. In addition to his doctoral work, Don attended the Harvard Graduate School of Education at the Universal Design for Learning Center Institute in 2010. His current research involves exploring the impact of augmented reality and virtual reality as assistive technologies for students with disabilities. And Don is a national presenter providing professional development sessions for both Gen Ed and Special Ed on using mobile devices. So I hope you guys really enjoy this because it looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> I brought a lot of things, so hopefully we can play with them. There'll be some audience participation here later, so I will. So if I ask you to please come up, please come up because I. It's not any fun to do this all by myself. It's a lot more fun when you participate. So first off, uh, my name is Dominic Mann again, and like a lot of you, I was an educator for a long time, so I'm really poor. Does anybody have a twenty-dollar bill that I could borrow? I know, but if anyone actually had a physical $20 bill, not like 20 collaboratively, but an actual $20 bill, that would be fine. I have a backup, if not. Excellent. The doctor Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. Stealing from students is exactly what we do in education. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thanks for the donation to my lab. We really appreciate it. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite examples of augmented reality. And today we're going to be talking about augmented reality and virtual reality and trying to connect them to the UDL framework. And for my point of view, that's pretty easy. Um, sometimes from the point of view of people who are reviewing my research articles, they, they're like, I think I want more. And so I've go, I think it's strongly connected to universal design for learning. And they go, we want you to explain that in four more paragraphs. And I go, okay, I will. So part of what's going to happen today is you're going to help me come up with ways. That is a good example of multiple means of engagement. And that can help increase the salience of goals. Because seriously, I'm going to be writing those down as soon as we're done. Because I need the help. So let's look at some examples of augmented reality and virtual reality. So that was plan B. Augmented reality and virtual reality have been in the news a lot recently. I've been focused on augmented reality for the last several years because I was kind of looking at technology forecasts and I was trying to decide what was going to kind of be one of our next big things. A lot of phones were already doing augmented reality apps that you could use in the classroom. And so that's where I started about four years ago. And I really wanted to try to get as much as possible to try to cut down on that incredible lag time between a cutting edge technology coming out and it making its way down to students with disabilities. From my point of view, it was kind of like Plinko. It hit everything before finally getting to my students. Commercial industries, gaming, gaming again, all of the vice-based industries. You know what I'm talking about. And everything else. And then finally education. And then finally special education. And my hope was that I could help to cut down on a little bit of that. This is kind of our mixed reality continuum. And this is probably the most boring slide I have. But this is the real world where we are currently. Augmented reality. This year we had the first breakout augmented reality app happened. Anybody play it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. You might have noticed herds of people walk, tramping through your flowers. They were playing Pokemon Go. Most successful mobile app ever. Most profitable app for in a concise amount of time, basically. I think in one month, it blew away all totals. Over here on the far side of things, is virtual reality, where I create a completely artificial space. When I'm telling my teachers how to tr keep these straight in your head, 
Think about it like this. You could cross the street using augmented reality. Ideally, you'd still look up, but you could cross the street. All those people playing Pokemon Go were able to still see the real world a little bit, at least. I should never cross the street wearing this device. I will get wiped out. I'll probably be dragging a computer behind me, and I definitely can't see anything other than the cool stuff that you'll get to see. So that's the easiest way to keep them straight. I think in the next several years, we're going to see a big explosion in these. But they've been around for a long time. Augmented reality used to cost millions of dollars. To get that red circle to go around that MIG and Top Gun it was a lot of money. Now your phone has that same capability in the Yelp app. Not really to shoot down MIGs, but to help you identify things. We've seen it in science fiction for years. You'll be able to look at something and get information about it. We finally are getting there. And Iron Man and our Minority Report. I just want screens all around me, like in Minority Report. Well, you can start to do that with the Microsoft HoloLens, and you can have screens all around you. It's really fun to watch Netflix and just make the undersea movie as big as the wall. It's not useful, really, but I mean, it's, it's, the, you know, it's the same information. But it's so much bigger, and it's a lot of fun. So in our next five years, these are going to explode. If you think about how disruptive mobile phones have been, we're looking at a revolution possibly bigger than mobile devices have been. Mobile devices have been pretty disruptive in our schools. A lot of good things, some challenges out there. Now imagine if it's a pair of smart glasses where you're all in a classroom together having shared experiences watching something in smart glasses. That's going to be a pretty big change for us. We need to be prepared for it as educators because it's coming whether you think it's a good idea or not. I'm not sure I want everyone to be wearing smart glasses that can tell things about me. I agree with you. I'm not sure people should be able to read my heart rate with smart glasses just by looking at me. But it's coming. So we need to prepare. We need to be thinking about it strategically. How do we make these useful in education? My first thought is that we need to be thinking about it in terms of universal design for learning. For me, as a special educator, that really matters because I really want to make sure that these become empowerment tools for my population. But regardless of who you're working with, we need to find ways to make these things practical. So it's going to be a huge market. So when we're playing around with AR, we have some pretty amazing connections that we can be doing with it. So we're getting pretty close to our audience participation point here. All right, who's going to be my first contestant? Sue, would you come? Sue seems like a really quiet and awesome person. So I'm going to have you hold this for me. <coughs> yep, just hold it right there at your chest. So this is an app called String AR Showcase, and it was kind of one of the first AR apps that I came across. And they were just kind of using it as a, come on, little buddy. It's a cool little demonstration technology. Come on. Well, not you, sorry, I was just talking to my little friend. Come on. And look, there's a whole little magical world in here. So much going on. And if you wouldn't mind just setting this one on the ground for me, Sue, just this maybe, one or? yeah, I'll take that one from okay. you. Okay. If you'll take that one and set it on the ground, maybe over there beside David, or, or that'll be fine. Right yep. <clears throat> and, okay, maybe a little closer, sorry. I'm getting a lot of reflection today. There's so much audience participation. Come on, little buddy. There you go. All right. And so I'm going to make him walk over your feet. There he goes. So he's really cute, right? Maybe not very educational, but really cute. But one of the things that we can do is find ways to make it really educational. So uh. 
right. Now make them walk to the report book. This is, a, I'm trying to remember what age he was then, but if I remember right, this is a second grade student who has an emotional disturbance who hates working on sight words. Really hates it, like things go airborne. Like chairs go airborne, not the flashcards. Working on sight words for 45 minutes. In my world as a special educator, that's some pretty powerful engagement. And that's a, you know, I could build on a couple 45 minutes and have myself a pretty good day. That first initial hook might be all that I need sometimes for some of my students. Or maybe I need something a little bit more intensive. So let's have a couple of other fun ones. How about, is that, I can't see your name tag. Betsy. All right, Betsy, come on down here. I want to show off some of the augmented reality apps that, one, are free, because I know we're giant fans of free. Betsy, are you good at sports? Uh, no. Me like neither. <laughs> Excellent. We're going to get along great, Betsy. All right. So, Betsy, your job is to sh pull that back and forth and sh play basketball to oh, the best I of your ability. make a basket? Yeah, just do your best. So this app is called AR Basketball. And possibly a little bit more educational. If you get closer, it'll wiggle less, probably. There you go. And maybe a little bit lower. You're shooting from the rafters. There you go. But how can we make this a little bit more educational other than, all right, class, let's play basketball? What can we work on? Excellent job, Bessie. All right, just keep playing for a second. All right. But how can we make this more educational? Absolutely, yeah. Wow, that, so I haven't had one say parabolic yet. Work on simple math. One of my favorite concepts is, all right, class, today we're going to work on something called mean, median, and mode. I want everybody to take out AR basketball. We're going to play AR basketball for five minutes. We're going to write all your scores on the board here. And then we're going to work on mean, median, and mode. Then after about 20 minutes, we're going to play some more AR basketball, and we're going to see if we got any better. That would be a pretty good math lesson. That was way more engaging than the nuns when they were teaching me math. I mean, they were nice people, but not really with the creativity. <laughs> so thank you so much, Betsy. Okay, my but, is oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Betsy did a great job there. So since we're talking science. Alex, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. My eyes aren't that great. Okay. Oh, no. Let's go. For this one app is called 4D Elements. And if you'll hold that for me. Yes, sir. And we've got some element blocks here. I've already lost one, so let's look at platinum there. <coughs> and so, so platinum becomes a little block of platinum. Let's try, I don't want to, okay, not plutonium, that sounds like a phosphorus. There we go. Phosphorus. Yeah, that looks happier. There we go. Oh, wow. So. Okay. And let's see, magnesium, I just saw oxygen somewhere. That'll do something, right? Ooh, gold. That's a happy one. Oh, here we go, magnesium and oxygen. I am not a chemist. But if we hold these two together. Huh. We have made magnesium oxide. Goo. I mean, magnesium oxide, what he said. And wow. 
That is pretty cool from my point of view. Now, does anybody see some potential examples of how this could be a UDL feature? Maybe this lesson involving these element blocks isn't going to be, the element blocks by themselves don't make the UDL lesson, but they are a feature from my point of view. And I think as researchers, we're going to have to, and practitioners, maybe we're working at, you know, we're going to build this UDL lesson brick by brick. We're going to play with magnesium oxide safely here with the element blocks. We're going to talk about it in the chemical formula over here on the whiteboard. We're going to watch a video about it over on the smart board. But everyone's also going to get this personal interaction in this moment to make magnesium oxide with their own building blocks. Thanks. <laughs> yes. So these you can buy from the company called Daiquiri. And if you tweet to me, I'll be tweeting out all of these and later, and I can give you a list. But um, the app itself is free. You can also just print the PDFs and make little blocks and cut them out. Um, print it on cardstock, it helps them last a little bit. Another little life hack I learned, if you take an empty Keurig or full Keurig, it doesn't really matter, but the little Keurig cup and put it inside the paper cutout, they last a lot longer and they give it some weight and they don't crush as easily because you're going to be using them with students. You could probably find something else to stuff in there as well, but the Keurig cup worked really good and I had a lot of them on hand. So, All right, let's look at anatomy. How about Cynthia? Would you be our contestant? So, <clears throat> all right. So we've got a naked person. Can I turn it? Yeah, you can turn it. Just don't cover the camera. There you go. And you can just turn on or off little body systems. Let's turn off, let's see if I can avoid, turn off that one right away with your students. I mean, unless you're teaching them, that's fine. The best, just for fun, I was doing this one time, it was a professional development with about 70 teachers all from the same district, and I asked this very nice woman who was probably in her late 60s to come up and to you do this. And I was like, just start turning off all the body systems and stuff like that. She turned off everything except for the reproductive system. And oh my gosh, the rest of the teachers in that audience just gave her hell for the rest of the day. It was awesome. I mean, I felt really bad for her. I didn't know people could turn that color of like red, but it was awesome. But anyways. Yeah, so she has this little dial here that she can turn on or off see the circulatory systems and yep and if you wanted to or she can kind of zoom in on think yeah sorry <laughs> there you go and I could take this and look around this one's called 4d anatomy it's also by Daiquiri the same company that made 4d elements they're both free and this one just has a little printout also they have a little interactive human heart but one of the things I like about this is if I have that science model of the human body, that's also nice, but every time I've looked in a catalog for one of those things, it's about 500 bucks. Um, that's kind of a one at a timer. I mean, you put 25 students around that at a time or 10 students around at a time, it's like the walking dead. They're just ripping out organs. It's kind of a mess. But here, everyone's able to have a very personal interaction with this AR content and to kind of get that experience. And I think that's, you know, she has to hold it. She has to be engaged for something to happen. But I haven't really found that to be a problem. So, Is there a way to, yeah. um, to hide this menu? And after, after a while, it just automatically hides? I don't even Yeah, I think if you that. just leave it alone for a second. But yeah, it doesn't. It takes a little while. Yeah. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Cynthia. All right, so next up, so they also have a human heart, but since I mentioned our heart rate app, how about Paul, GBR contestant? 
You don't mind being on camera, Paul, do you? Yeah. Excellent. All right, so just look at there. So this app is called Heart Rate, and there are several of these. But when we're talking about kind of the scary potential of some of these technologies, yeah, imagine this in glasses. But this is reading his heart rate just by looking at his face. It's very possible that your glasses will be able to do this for you in a few years. The HoloLens can probably do it in six months, as soon as someone actually ports that app over to there, which I haven't checked this week, it might have already happened. But how could I use this in an educational setting? Yeah, hey, your heart rate's up. It's an easy way to test. It's a whole lot easier than, I was always bad at that. I don't know about everyone else, but someone would talk or something and I go, oh man, I gotta start over. So, excellent, thank you, Paul. Absolutely, yeah, let's work on some self-regulation, some options for self-regulation. I've pitched that one a lot with this app because a lot of the students that I work with have some emotional or behavior concerns. So, all right, let's work on calming yourself down. I know you're upset right now. Okay, your heart rate is at 90. I bet if you take 10 deep breaths, I bet you can get it into the 70s. That might be just of enough of a redirection to help bring one of my students from the alternative school that I worked at back from the brink. I'll take that any day. All right. so. Let's look at a few more fun ones. How about any science teachers in here? David, would you like to come do one? <laughs> I think you are. All right. So this one is called iSolar System. And what I think is pretty exciting about this one, if you'll just hold that for a second, is it's a com free companion app to this book. So I buy this book. Like all of our other ones that we've had, we've had these little markers that I have to print out and travel around with me around my lab and around the country that get beat up. But a lot of publishers are doing these books where, let's see if we can just look at it with the app now. Now I've got an interactive model of the solar system where I can actually, I think there's even a little menu here, and we could, yeah, so I'll just let you explore for a second. So there's Earth. And so, and I think this speed guy here can, slow things down if you're getting dizzy by what, it going too fast. But I can fast forward and make the solar system, you know, this is where this would look like in a year of things moving. I can make things move very slow. But there's, you know, about 20 pages in this book and each one of them is a trigger for some type of interactive simulation or lot kind of virtual lab activity that a student could use and again, I don't think any of these would be the whole of my UDL focused science lesson, but I could look at them, I could look at this component and say, all right, I implemented this UDL feature. This is why I think it is, I'm using AR to provide multiple means of representation and engagement and lots of action and expression because he's having to navigate and be engaged, it's a lot better than the sit and get of, hey, listen, Mr. Don, talk about the planets. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, that was my wife. I'm really excited that it was. <laughs> I was hoping it was yeah. uh, so, perfect, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I'll hand that. And I'm also going to put it on do not disturb mode. <laughs> <laughs> that went much better than it possibly could have. So it's what I get for telling the story about the teacher who got all embarrassed in front of everyone. It's fate. 
All right. So just as I had mentioned, all the ones that you just saw were examples that required some type of marker that somebody had already made. The first app I showed you was called Erasma. And how many of you have used Erasma or have heard of it? Sweet. All right. For those of you that have not, Erasma is, it made that $20 bill thing happen, which was kind of fun. That's a pre-made one. Erasma is really designed to be an advertising company. They want to have Coca-Cola have paid them millions of dollars so they can make a little, you look at the Coke can and the Coke can does a little dance and a little animation happens and that's great. But Erasma is really friendly to educators and to people who aren't educators who just want to make stuff. So you can take a picture and match it up with a picture or a video that you already have on your device and create your own AR content. And if I can match up a picture with an object or a video with an object, I can do a whole lot of things as kind of an education hacker. So these are augmented reality vocabulary words that I've created. And if I look here at the large intestine one that I created, okay, maybe that's not the most pleasant one, but. Come on, Erasma. The large intestine is the end of intestine that is wide and short. It includes the sarcoma, colon, and rectum. Okay, let's go with what's. <laughs> the kidneys are a pair of organs that remove waste from blood and excrete urine. So I made these not very hard to make videos. It took me you know, 10 minutes to make each video and they repeat, have the computer talk, and I've now created a vocabulary word that provides its own definition. What's a lot more fun though is to have a teacher do it for their classroom. All right, I want everybody to take one of these seventh grade hard science vocabulary words that we've got coming up for this unit and in pairs of two, you're going to be making an Erasma of that, providing a definition. You can talk, you can have a computer talk, you can make, out, make any type of video that you want to explain what a pyroclastic cloud is. And instead of having to just learn pyroclastic cloud, which is a really hard word to decode, now you've got this vocabulary word where the definition provides itself. What I think is, that's pretty amazing to me, right? And it's easy, and it's free. When we're talking about project-based learning, an activity where, all right, we're gonna make interactive vocabulary word walls, and they're all going to be around the room, and the only thing that you have to do, really, is make sure that each one is kind of distinct enough. You can hand draw them, you can, I made these in PowerPoint and just threw a bunch of jumbles of shapes and things in there, but you know, kind of functioning a little bit like a QR code, except it doesn't read quite that fine. But you can create your own. It's relatively easy. And you can teach your students to do it. I've seen third graders do it. I haven't tried it with younger than that yet, but I'm, you know, my daughter's four. It's not too long away. So I'll let you know. But Erasma could possibly be one of your first introductions to AR in the classroom. I just was involved in a study that happened at Mercyhurst where they used it for their teacher education program and all of their teachers learned how to make these Erasma video models of how to solve different types of math problems and then when they went out to their practicum they went and deployed them and their kids went wild. They thought this was incredibly cool and sometimes that's just enough to where you know math class was cool today. I'll take that. Yes? Is the interface easy enough that you could envision students using it to demonstrate it? Yeah. So I, could they create the word, the definition, and make it virtual? I think so, yes. Because you can record the video right there from the app. They could explain, all right, I'm going to teach you what I'm doing. Here's how I'm solving this math problem. You know, you, here's how you borrow. And then 
they can match that up with the word borrow or something else. So it is pretty quick. Yes? That's awesome. Cool. <coughs> yeah, sorry. I think I have a mic for this type of thing. Hello? OK, maybe just shout. Nice. I think Erasmus is one of those things that I think will, that is starting to have a good bit of penetration out into our schools where it's actually getting used. And hopefully, we'll see a nice explosion of other easy to use AR apps out there. Especially when you know, we started off with some AR apps that were already available, easy to use, available on mobile devices that have stuff already made for them where you just have to download it, look at something, use that marker to trigger something. Erasmus takes that up a little bit of a step where, all right, now I have to be a little bit more creative. I have to make my own content. And we're starting to see a lot of things that are kind of getting a lot more, taking AR to a more complex level. This one, I think it's kind of fun to know the history of this. So this, there was a, an app called WordLens, where it took English and translated it into another language. Google thought that was a really great idea, so they bought it, and they bought it right after I paid for all the language packs. Uh, and then they gave it to all of you for free in the Google Translate app. So just in Google Translate, you look at words in English, and it will translate them into another language, in this case French, in real time. That's pretty. It's not perfect translation, but it is generally getting better all the time. If you find errors, you can tell them and they'll work on trying to get them fixed. But think about what it's doing. It's taking another language and translating it into English pretty much instantaneously. I think that's really cool, but my hope is in five years, maybe, why couldn't it take eighth grade reading material and turn that into fifth grade reading material? That would be incredibly helpful for many of my students. If it was built into glasses, could it overlay a really hard word and realize that I'm looking at that and give me a synonym that maybe I know? You are really looking a long time at this word that is called oper, oper, what's the word? Operationalize? Operationalize. <laughs> yeah, the O word, yeah. If, you, yeah. if you were here at our meeting yesterday, no one in the meeting could say the word. But let's say I was looking at the O word and I'm not able to say that. It could go, you, you're obviously struggling with that. Let me give you the easier synonym for that. So. I don't think we're that far away from that. And you know, any of you that are designers, I'd love to have you make that. And feel free to take that idea and get rich. Yes.
like, oh, Mr. Brown, are you going to get a Google Glass or something like that? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm holding off the implant. Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, your opinion on something like that where, you know, we're going to walk around with augmented reality on board without having to use a, a personal device. It's kind of out there, but I'm just curious. No, there are, there are people looking at it. Google has a, a patent right now for the contact lenses that in theory can do what um, the uh, smart glasses can do. So I guess I'd have a lot, I'd be a lot more on board personally with smart glasses versus some type of neural implant because man, the next year when neural implant two comes out, I'm gonna be so mad, right? You know, maybe, if, maybe it'll just be a USB port that'll but then when USB port for the brain 2.0 comes out, I'm gonna be like so mad again. So I don't know. I kind of think, uh, well, I'm sure that people will attempt it, but I think for the, most of us, we'll probably be happy with some smart glasses uh, that hopefully you might have. Society of, like, you can get a better job because you think faster than me because you can faster because you can afford a better implant. There, there are tons of equity issues that are going to come up in the next decade around technology and just, you know, the, we were talking about the you know, universal design for learning and also kind of just being futurist. Uh, yesterday, one of our thoughts was, let's just look at trucking. It's one of the most common occupations in America. It's long haul trucking could, half of that bit market could go to Uber and or Uber trucking, or whoever becomes Uber trucking, in you know, let's say five to seven years, you know, there are already test runs happening in Europe right now. That'd be a change. So we're going to see some, in all of these things, and I kind of think the importance of UDL is because our the dream is that we're going to teach students to be expert learners, and mobile devices. We saw that trend start in 2009 in a lot of ways, where mobile learning was taking off, where instead of going to your classroom to learn and be prepared for my future life, I n had teachers that were starting to prepare me for using the device in my pocket to solve problems that I haven't yet faced yet because that's the reality that we generally have, right? When you come across something, some type of new problem, you might pull up a YouTube video to help you solve that problem in place. I was at my house in the laundry room. I was wondering, why is the washing machine not draining? I pulled up a YouTube video for my LG model, placed the iPad right there beside me, and pulled up the YouTube video on that. And right there, there was a nice woman who explained for my model that it was probably a sock stuck in some type of water pump thing. She pulled these two screws out, pulled the panel off, you're going to find probably a sock, and we're going to find about two dollars worth of change, and it's all going to smell horrible. Also, get lots of towels. I wish I had heard the part about towels sooner. She was right about it smelling horrible, and I did have four dollars of change, and it was a sock. But yes. Yes. I have a young son with Down syndrome, and my goodness, I can teach him to run this bus and run that train, etc. But what happens if it's broken? Bingo. Mm -hmm. Here's the alternative, and the arrow showed, and you interacted with that wearable. Yeah, that video is kind of the dream that we had hoped that Google Glass would be. I think it will. There, they will be a. Um, the one, next one that we'll see actually did a pretty decent job of that right off the bat. But that was kind of our hope, and some of my grant writing's been around that concept of context awareness with smart glasses. So I know your profile and the accommodations that you need and your schedule. And this looks a lot like bus three, but is not bus three. Don't get on this bus, please. It's early. That's causing problems for everybody. But So everything I've shown you requires a some type of marker so far. But how many of you have the Yelp app? On your Yelp app, there's a little thing called Monocle down here at the bottom. 
So, uh, not, so not search, but monocle. And this is a good example of kind of the dream of what I have. It'll look better if I go sideways. Sorry about that. So let's see what's nearby us here. Taste of Punjab. Uh, Red Dog Pub is over there. Yep. The British Chippy, the fried chicken and pizza. The Smoky Bones. I was there the other day. I think it deserves more than three and a half stars, but I had a great experience. But apparently they're, man, that's, a, that's not a great review. But this is functioning as an internet browser, basically for information that's nearby you. That's pretty important. You know, granted, right now it's only doing something that isn't that exciting. It's telling us about restaurants. But there's an app called Layer, and I'll show you, um, if, we have time, if we have time, I'll show you a picture of it. But I was at Pearl Harbor, and I was able to pull up Layer and an app called Wiki Loves Monuments, and I'm looking over at the USS Missouri, and I know it's the USS Missouri, but I was able to look at it, and it, would, it labeled it, that's the USS Missouri. I can get a tap on it, and it would take me to an article about the USS Missouri so I could find more information. That's really my hope, that we can use our mobile devices to have a learning environment, and especially with the AR tools that are out there, to have a learning environment that fo follows us wherever we are to solve problems. Yes? So, who created that data for the USS It was through the app, and it's also on another AR app called Wikitude, but Wiki loves monuments. Basically, every most monuments have the uh, latitude and longitude and built into the Wikipedia page. It's scanning Wikipedia to see if there's monuments nearby you. And so uh, some of them, depending on how you set the settings, will actually show things like, look, that radio station there is KXL something, you know. And if they put in their GPS information, it will show up on your Wiki Loves Monuments. Sometimes that leads to a lot of noise because you probably aren't excited about the historic significance of, you know, your local TV station, but you do know that it's over there now. Absolutely, yes. There are uh, some actual AR apps out there where you can create your own treasure hunts. Uh, one of them is called, a it's, I think it's R-S-A-R-I-S. -I, I haven't used it in a while, but um, there are more and more of them out there where you can do things like that. So these were kind of easy examples of AR that's available on your own smart glasses, or on your own mobile devices, not smart glasses. But if you have smart glasses, that would be great. This is the Microsoft HoloLens, and I'll see if I can get a contestant to come up. Would anybody want to come try these? Come on over. Yeah, all right. Nothing too horribly embarrassing. Nope. <laughs> so just real quick primer to select things with the HoloLens. There's a little menu that you can see there uh -huh. to make the menu go away. You do this little hand motion. Like that? Yep. Except it can't see you. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. But I need but yeah. to know that yep. I'm getting it That's right. it. Yep. And then to select things, you hold your finger up and then you tap it. Okay. Got it. Yep. All right. So let's, I can adjust this here at the back. Oh, okay. How's that feel? Funky. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so hopefully you can see what we have here. If you'll walk this way, and then can you look over that way at our audience? Maybe there's an elephant over there. Look over there. Is there an elephant in the room? Kind of look down. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's in the audience. He moved. He moved. All right, do you see where you've got that little menu up for Microsoft Edge? If you'll look up and to the right, mm -hmm. so oh kind of God, tap. This is hard. Well, it's really easy if I get, take you through the eight minute training. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, see where it says remove? We're just gonna close that. See, it's on the top right. Okay. Okay, okay. So you kind of, I'm gonna move your head. Your head is the mouse. My head is the mouse. There you go. So just, whoop, it's 
straight up. Yeah. Nope, you're perfect. I see the elephant. Yeah. Well, you had a big screen in front of you. So these are AR smart glasses. This is the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, it's only available to developers, or it's a development edition now. You can most they've opened it up to just let anyone buy it with a caveat. It's a development div edition. If it's not working for you, sorry. But it's 300. I mean, it's, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not not jumping into that one, though I, I do use a Mac personally. The reason why I have two projectors right now is because I can't make things play nice between the two of them. But, um, so look over here, we have some other little critters. So I've got a big shark over here. Uh, at some point, I think I might have closed it, but I actually had a window where I had a video about sharks right beside my shark model. I think I have the words UDL labeled over somewhere in our, yep. oh, okay, great, yep. So, pretty cool. That is really cool. So, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you'll open up our menu. Great. Okay, perfect. So, let's place our first hologram somewhere. So, if you'll put, go to that little center box that says holograms. Yeah. So, you got to look down at it. Yep, good. And then straight up and then just kind of straight up and straight down. Yeah. There you go. And then tap it somewhere. Straight up and straight down. There you go. Yeah, it's got a thing. I feel like I'm learning how to use an AAC device. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and granted, we're all probably on the network right now, so it's having to think real hard. So let's pick, how about, how about the puppy? Does the puppy seem like a good one? So there you go. And you can kind of look around and decide where we should put our puppy friend. Oh, that seems like an excellent spot for a puppy. And then you can click hide menu and he'll be cuter. I have a puppy in my office all the time now. So cool. These are all kind of some really simple kind of basic holograms. There are also some much more complex ones that are out there. And I, you know, I wish I, I'll keep, I'll stay around as long as I can, but I, you know, it would be cool if everyone could have a chance to have this. But think about a teacher being able to have this as a shared experience. All right, I'm going to pull up an interactive human heart right now. Let's all look at this model. All right, where, you know, who can label these parts for me? Who can help? Let's build something collaboratively in an engineering class, and we're all going to be able to interact with the model at the same time, or the hamster, or whatever is happening in our world. One of my favorite ones is you can set up a little aquarium so little fish will swim around. Here, let's do hollow aquarium. So, okay, no, it's fine. All right, so you see that plus over on the right hand side? Oh, yeah, sorry. How about I go back? Just tap. Just put that there. Okay, and then if you'll go straight up, there you go. And go to that plus, there you go. And I think there should be one called hollow aquarium, holographic aquarium. I can't see quite what you, uh, left maybe, is that it? Is it saying? Oh, my eyes are really fuzzy. Oh, okay, sorry. No, it's okay. I'm just struggling to find it. Or, oh, Galaxy Explorer, let's do that. That's the same. That is also a really pretty one. So just click it somewhere, and it'll ask you to place the earth somewhere in our room. I love placing the earth too, it's really fun. Yeah, so it's gonna load up for a second. What I like about, we're also gonna play with some VR experiences, but one of the things I really like about the concept of AR in a classroom setting is, you know, as a teacher I could still see all of my students. My students can still see each other. Interacting with the physical world is you know, useful occasionally. You can't, you know, trying to type on a keyboard without being able to see the keyboard. I've had to do it a few times in VR. I'm not nearly as good of a typist as I thought I was. So, yep, yeah, just place that somewhere. And so it's kind of going through a narration right now. She can hear it really well. Unfortunately, uh, we can't. <laughs> so there's our little solar system. And you can just kind of select some different things. 
And feel free to walk around the room. Oh, really? Yeah, check out your solar system. I mean, you're. If you click back on the solar system or Crab Nebula or something, yeah. Sorry, I'm learning. See if you can select our solar system again, because I think that one really makes a nice model. So one of the little items will be our solar system. I just, yeah, sure. Maybe it's down. Pillars of creation spread a crab nebula. Or look down. Uh, there's a menu somewhere. There it is, solar system. Boom. Yay. And I think you can even select the individual planets again if you want to find out more about them. I got to say, I'm kind of like Iron Man. I like this. That's kind of what we're hoping that education, you know, our classrooms can be where they can, you can have students engaging in these interactive simulations. Well, we have a very engaged participant, so I would say multiple means of engagement immediately is coming to mind. What are some others that, you know, maybe some specific guidelines that you're seeing some connections to? Yeah, multiple means of representation, especially for there's some simulations about uh, the plant cell and things like that. It's really hard to get a sense of scale unless you can, you know, uh, for some of those things, but an interactive simulation would do a good job of that. It's stuck in the sun. All right. <laughs> I think, uh, look at, see if you've got a little back button down there. Look down, there's a menu. So if you put the pointer, there you go. Ah, there's our solar system. Cool. All right. Well, good job. I might have to take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Agera. Thanks. And that's just one of many AR kind of smart glasses that are going to be coming out in the near future. Um, Microsoft has gone towards a model of trying to kind of license their Microsoft holographic platform to other manufacturers. I think Asus and Acer are coming out with models this summer that will still have to be tethered to a computer, but they're going to be more in the five to six hundred dollar range versus three thousand dollars, which makes it a lot more realistic probably for the average classroom. But there are lots of other manufacturers in this space. There's a company called Magic Leap that if you're not following uh, check out the news about Magic Leap sometimes. Uh, they haven't released any details on their products, but their demo videos, we'll find out eventually if the demo videos live up to the hype. But the demo videos are absolutely, astoundingly impressive. So, I, really, I think everyone's actually just watching them right now, which is understandable. I, Choose your own adventure, everybody. <laughs> but let's see if I can pull up one real quick. No, thank you. Yep, someone just found one. We won't watch him play the video game. But he plays the video game and it looks really cool. Robots break out of the walls. It's really fun. So, so that's kind of a quick primer on AR. I think there are some quick, just immediate things that make sense where, hey, these are going to be great educational tools. And I hope that you've seen some things that will have expressed that 
to you as well. Next up, let's look at some virtual reality options. So the easiest, cheapest way to get into VR is something like this, like Google Cardboard. I'm, most of you have probably seen Google Cardboard, right? You take your smartphone and slide it into some either $2 piece of cardboard or $20 plastic thing like this. And there are VR apps out there for your phones right now that you can use to show off these things. One of the easiest ways to get into AR and VR work is to look on your smartphone and to just search and see what's out there. Or my other favorite tool is go to Pinterest and go VR and AR in education or, and see what other educators are posting out there. And it's you know, an easy way to keep up with it. To kind of start to creating your own VR content, most of us probably are not programmers, right? I'm not. And I really, really wish I had been. But the easiest way to do it is to record something. This is a 360 degree camera. And how about, uh, who haven't I picked on? Anybody? I need a volunteer. Anybody? Come on down. Oh, sorry, that's upside down. So. Yeah, that's basically what this is. It's a poor person's Google Street View car. So this is a 360 degree camera. This one's called the 360 Fly. And it has, obviously it's shooting in 360 degrees. So I could record a video, put it in Google Cardboard, and make it play on a device like this. And let's say you're taking a trip this summer you're a foreign language teacher, you could, that works perfectly, you could put it on your helmet or on a walking stick and you could, let's say you're going to San Jose, Costa Rica, you could do a walking tour of San Jose, Costa Rica and so when I go back and teach Spanish to my students, all right, I want you to watch this video in your Google Cardboard, I want you to look for 10 things that are being advertised on the streets of San Jose. It's a pretty easy way that we could start to use 360 degree video with and virtual reality without having to be you know, computer programmers or just hope that we can find good content out there on some type of store. So what are some other ways that we might be able to use 360 degree video? You guys are quiet today. Yes. So using the VR to create empathy by taking someone to a different setting and you know how many times have we seen there was another bombing in Syria and there's continued fighting in Syria well and there's continued fighting in northern Iraq against ISIS go to a YouTube video not right this second go to a YouTube video for, and find the 360 degree video of fighting in Mosul and see what the resistance to ISIS looks like. I was kind of thinking that it might look like people who were, you know, in the Iraqi army fighting and, you know, something that looked more military. It looked more like it was much less organized than I had thought and I, I was thinking, I really wish the Iraqi army was going to be there to help these people fight them. This. This looks less organized than I had hoped. It looks like a soccer riot with mortars. Um, but that's kind of what it looked like. And when I show that video to people, they're like, I, that, it's just, it's striking. And it takes you to that moment in a way that nothing else I, I can't imagine will other than actually being there. That moment where you put the headset on and you're, driving with an armored column and are you paying attention to what's in front of you 
Or are you paying attention to a small child on the side of the road? Or are you paying attention to someone in the market and, you know, wow, there was just a bombing. But look, life still goes on. I mean, people are still selling socks. Who would still be selling socks? But you know what? Someone was still selling socks. And that made, you know, for whatever reason, selling socks had a big emotional connection to me. For somebody else, maybe it was, you know, one of the children walking by in the video. But that moment for VR to create that storytelling, that empathy moment is pretty impressive, I think. So, great, thanks. Questions? Yes. One of the first ones, the HoloLens has Skype built in. And we've been playing around with, in my lab right now, kind of on-demand help through Skype for certain activities. I'm coming across a new manufacturing problem. And one of the cool things that you can do in Microsoft Skype, if you have it on a Windows 10 computer and uh, the HoloLens, we discovered that's how you have to make it work, by the way. But you could be, let's say you're coming across a novel assembly situation. I can be on my computer over here, and I can draw a line that you will see in front of you to, I need you to take this widget and plug it into this what's it and pair them together. Nope, you need to make this one go like that. and. And it, so that's one potential way that we can do it with smart glasses. Most of the AR apps that I've seen on mobile devices are a little bit more, they're, they're definitely more simple. And there's a lot less computing power. So yes? Well, and this is simpler than your most OK. Computer, but in the it was always a, I'm doing an uh, AR, and there's uh, things around that are essentially help buttons. Yes. And, I'm doing this pretty much on my own, but if I do want a high level, medium level, or low level mentor to help me, uh, that I can just you know look over there, <coughs> open up, and anyway, that kind of thing. Just yeah, I think that's one of the things that, especially as we work with developers, that maybe we could try to include more because I don't think, for the most part, that's happening at this point. Um, but I will definitely take that consideration because we're making our first HoloLens app, which is, from my point of view, really basic. But, um, and I'm trusting all of you so nobody beat me to market. But think about a first grade classroom. We label everything, door is door, chair is chair. It doesn't right now have the capability to label it independently, but if I was a teacher, I could la put labels on things. You saw that I spelled out UDL in here. To do that currently, I have to find the U, place it somewhere, place an L. And what we're making are boxes where I can put in a label and a description or a label and a picture to provide more information about something. And then when I click on it, it provides, it reads it aloud text-to-speech for me. It's that kind of initial first step into building a literacy-rich environment with AR, which I think hopefully will uh, is a something that's needed. And it was kind of fun to go through the design process. It's my first time going all the way through the design process. All right, we're going to take about five minutes and actually play with the HTC Vive real quick, which is kind of our high-end example of virtual reality. So I need one more guinea pig, if you don't mind. Anybody? Jose, would you like to come play? All right. That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think most people are able to wear it with glasses, but you can tell me if, if you feel comfortable. How's that? And I can also loosen that up for you. 
Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you are at Monument Valley, and I'm going to give you uh, these two controllers here. They'll show up here in a second. Oh, sorry, I did that. Okay. So you've got two controllers in front of you. Okay. And I think if you push forward on this thing here, you'll be able to kind of explore the world, fly around. And what's the, uh, what's the do? Uh, this one also kind of gives you some controls. What happens oh. if I crash into the wall? Uh, it'll, you'll kind of fly up over it. You can't hurt yourself unless you fall over the chairs behind you. <laughs> it is not the Matrix. It's pretty peaceful. <laughs> yeah. So I've had a lot of fun with this. Just explore. Uh, one of my favorite instructional tools, regardless of AR or VR, is the g desktop version of Google Earth. Do they have like um, warnings about drug use? No. Uh, they probably should. <laughs> in Colorado and Washington, it's like. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to back up a little bit. Okay. So let me. OK, and I'm going to see if we can just back this up a little bit. So who built this environment? Uh, this is the whole Google Earth engine. So if you'll just select one of the, maybe the Matterhorn or Manhattan. So okay. here, I'll pull up those menus again. Oh yeah, I think you got one. Yeah, great. So we're in Manhattan. Feel free to explore. <laughs> oh, okay. And so you can fly up and fly down. And if you slow down a second, I think some of, you see how the buildings are taking a second to render? They'll, more and more detail will pop up. It takes it a second to actually download all those buildings and things like that. Mm -hmm. There are also VR simulations for the inside and interactive games about going through the arteries and exploring the human heart and lots of other. <laughs> Probably not. That much detail. <laughs> so, one of the things I like about Google Earth VR is obviously you're able to take your students to an entirely different part of the world, go on a walking tour, see. You know, when you're having a lesson on erosion in the Grand Canyon, you can take your students to the Grand Canyon and see, you know. Can I go underwater? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I think it'll stop you. In regular Google Earth, you can actually go underwater. They have all, most of the shipwrecks are down there. You can go to the Titanic underwater and they have it broken just as Ballard found it in two parts and has the gash right where it's supposed to. So that's one of my favorite lessons and when I'm you know, teaching teachers about Google Earth, uh, the regular desktop version, not the VR version here. So, well, all right, I think we've got about five minutes left. So, all right, if I take it away from you. No. <laughs> Perfect. So that's at least one example of hopefully kind of showing some of the potential of uh, Google Earth there in VR. And I think we have about five minutes left, so any questions? Did anybody see something cool that they hadn't seen before today? At least one. Okay, that's good. That's all I really aim for. If, I, if there's, you found one thing that you'd like to try, it was worth your time. So, I don't know, any questions, any hope? We're seeing it to some extent, like with the book earlier, and some other some textbook manufacturers. I think Hughlin Mifflin had a companion app at one point uh, three years ago, but I'm not sure if they stuck around with it. Yes, they were at UTC. Yeah. Or cardboard. Yeah. 
because not that I'm a giant fan of textbook manufacturers all the time, but they're an important part of our ecosystem. But if they can be partners for some of the content creation, so it's not always on the backs of classroom teachers to create those AR experiences, you know, you're probably still going to be making your own AR field trip. But as much as possible, I can do some things and find that way to use AR at least expose them to it or expose them to VR because our students are going to be expected to use these technologies in the future. When they leave us, even if let's say they're a senior right now, their job in 10 years, their job right now, their, their boss expects them to have the skill of messaging. I'm finding with my students with developmental disabilities that we've all taken texting for granted. Texting stupid, blah, blah, blah. Well, now it's also an important means of communication. And when your boss needs to reschedule you, frequently they might do it through a text message. Well, if I'm having trouble reading, well, I need to build, turn, make sure that I have on accessibility features. If I have a limited ability to articulate or to type, I need to have that skill. I feel the same way about AR and VR. We need to start future-proofing our students, at least by just exposing to them, to, hey, this concept is out here. We can get a little bit of digital information overlaid on top of the real world. An easy way that a teacher could introduce AR would be take, there's an app called um, Virtual Compass, which is really basic. I look through the camera, and I've got a compass of you know all the different degrees, and I could start a field little scavenger hunt there at the football field, start at the goal post, go from at 33 degrees, and walk that way till you hit that cone there, and then use that cone to find the next cone and to see who can go navigate the maze correctly. And that's the best, you know, kind of easy introduction that you might have to introducing AR to something like a science classroom. Yes? Yep. Like the Yeah. Um, also, uh, thinking about it, I was figuring most of, I, I didn't include a lot of younger stuff, but there's an app called AR Flashcards, which is very creatively augmented reality flashcards. But they, originally it was just letters, and uh, my daughter and I love doing that. O is an owl, and you click on it, and it hoots and says O, oh, and happy little things like that. But they've also just added, AR, a whole selection of AR animals, AR dinosaurs, now AR math, which every time I print it and get them all in order, my daughter knocks them off the table and there's like a hundred like little pieces of paper all over my house. But, you know, you've got these little, you know, one plus one and your little apples or seven plus nine and, or subtraction ones are out there too. So that's kind of a nice, you know, it's an easy way for them to expand out. They had this huge collection of these great resources, and now, you know, originally it was just the alphabet letters, and now between all the different ones, they've got, you know, I think like 400 different markers for that one app. So that's pretty powerful, I think. And nice, nice scale and growth. Yes. Yeah. You've given us plenty to think about. And the harder part is, and engagement seems, okay, we get that. And the harder part is to learn how to do things, you know, skills and strategies. Yes. And uh, it's still striking me that there's quite a, you know, there's a, exploiting that advantage, you can see it sort of in learning to ski, that actually, if you can hook me up to the, you know, the motoric things, I can be practicing skiing, but, we can additionally, it seems, uh, have some mentoring going along with it so that you can see, well, you know, you don't get your skis parallel soon enough or whatever, and someone can say, do you want help? And all of that. I'm just wondering how long before you think that they're good enough 
to really be able to practice a skill and get feedback on it. And, and generalize it to a, hopefully a new plan. Yeah. Or drive your wheelchair, of course, would be really cool. That would be, actually. And, um, I, you know, one of the first things I was thinking is, as you just said, wheelchair is giving people that experience of, wow, this is what it looks like to actually navigate this place, which is, which says it's ADA compliant. And I frequently have found with my students that are have mobility problems, that's helpful to label somewhere, but uh, those concrete things still manage to separate about two inches, and that, that starts to become a big problem. So. I mean, I think that's probably a, a harder step, especially for, and as people move into designing things, I think that's something they need to be thinking about. How can we provide some error correction yeah. for this or some feedback? How do I get additional information? Okay, I have, okay, it told me, let's say for the math, uh, one of the augmented reality math apps, it, it told me this great story or it explained it to me in this word problem, and I thought I had it right, but I didn't. How, I need some error correction, and I need some more in-depth feedback. And right now, I, I think that would be a, a harder level of yeah, complexity. You should do it. Yeah. I, I think, uh, well, I'm going to think about that as we're starting to do some design work, because providing error correction would be incredibly important. Hey, what is this label? And because I'd like to have my student try to say it correctly, and then if they do not say it correctly, it could provide corrective feedback. I do think sometimes that action and expression piece is harder to think about with, especially some of the cutting edge tools, because other than they're interacting, what if they're not interacting correctly? Yeah. Well, they're, they're still interacting. <laughs> but. And even just, can I point at things that would be valuable I just want to give you an anecdote. Yeah. The first kid we worked with that was uh, had locked in syndrome, really had no physical capacities of his head. Uh, after we got him so that he could uh, drive his wheelchair, we said, what do you really want to give him to drive? And he got, uh, whatever it was on the internet or something, got a tank, which is what he wanted to really drive. Because then if he came up to barriers, he would just blow them away. And I thought, <laughs> this is a good image. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that is perfect. So, yeah, my, my favorite group that I've worked with recently with VR, um, and this will be my last story because I think I'm already over time, but we are working with a group of, most of the stuff I work on is academic things, but uh, students with developmental disabilities also have some um, much lower levels of exercise on average than uh, their peers without disabilities. And, when engaging with the exercise bike, they would ride about two, three minutes, and I've had enough of this. And we hooked up the exercise bike to a VR exercise game called Verzoom, and the average amount of exercise now is the recommended daily level of 30 minutes at a time, or at least 30 minutes total a day. So, you know, that's, yeah. it's, we went from two minutes to 30 minutes, and a whole ton of engagement. So, and that app actually does do a good bit of corrective feedback because if you're not in the right place, it'll, it, the makers have provided some prompts. I think they did that out of an abundance of caution because if, with some of the VR stuff, if you really aren't using it correctly, you'll get motion sickness like I do riding in the back of a car and that goes, they, they didn't want that to happen. So. Well, thank you so much for coming, and if you have any other questions, I'll be around. Thanks. <laughs> oh, and here.